Uh, first of all, thank you, Greg, uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, what I took this as was an opportunity just to riff. So I, I hope you don't mind. The, Greg said you're first. It's for an audience that is going to be thinking broadly about digital health and AI. I'll wait. You can get that. That's <laughs> oh, okay. But um, so take this as high level. Welcome anyone to tweet at HMKL. Uh, if you, I say anything, try not to embarrass me. Uh, disclosures. So one of the issues is, you know, this is going to cure everything. We're going to have everything fixed because of this. I mean, medicine's going to be forever different. We, we hear this all the time, and the question is, how are we going to bridge between hype, often uh, with little evidence? I mean, the whole issue about Theranos, by the way, just to introduce Theranos, is where was the evidence? Where was the public transparency? Where was the validation of what they did? Con she was worth $9 billion at one point. The company was going to transform the way in which medicine was practiced. And th this is emblematic of a lot of what's going on in our field, which is there's a lot of hope, uh, a lot of aspiration, a lot of possibility, but there's also a lot of claims. And one of our major issues is going to be to try to bridge uh, this. And you know, the notion is that, I mean, people talk about artificial intelligence, some, the AMA wants to call it augmented intelligence because they want to make sure you know it's not going to replace doctors. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out the technical piece of this, but there's also going to be a very important cultural part of it, which is, you know, who's going to trust these new systems, these new approaches? To, to what extent are they new approaches anyway? And, you know, some of our cultural frame comes from uh, the movies and our literature and science fiction. And I, I'm sure you all know uh, this quote, uh, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. Do, do, do you know this uh, quote? Uh, so I just try this, I don't usually do this, but let's see if this works. You read me, Hal? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. <laughs> What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Dave. Hey. Although you took very thorough precautions in the pod against my hearing you, I could see your lips move. Well, you get the idea. <laughs> the, the, the cultural uh, idea about whether AI is actually going to help us or destroy us is um, not exactly new um, and has been reverberated through a wide variety of, let's see, how do I? Wide variety of, of genre and, you know, including what James Cameron did around when Skynet becomes self-aware. Um, but even more recently, the issues with the 737 MAX raise the question of who's in charge of the plane and to what extent can we depend on these systems to keep us safe? Now, that being said, the autopilots and all of the technology and the artificial intelligence that exists within the planes have no doubt saved more lives than we've lost. But it still disturbs the public who wonders whether or not we can trust information that's being processed in this way. And I just, I know this is hard to see in the audience, but I want to refer you to an article that came out in Nature uh, just this week called Machine Behavior, in which there was an outline of the various different ways in which uh, we need to think about how AI may be affecting our lives. Anything from 
news ranking algorithms? Do the algorithms create filter bubbles? Does the algorithm disproportionately censor content? To algorithmic justice, do they discriminate against a racial group in granting parole? To predictive policing systems increase false conviction rates? People are using predictive models for this. Autonomous vehicles, autonomous weapons, algorithmic trading, al algorithmic pricing, online dating, uh, conversational robots. The, there are many ways in which our society, the central fabric of it, is already being deeply influenced and in some ways made vulnerable, but also stronger in many ways by the use of these algorithms. And when, as we contemplate its introduction and integration into medicine, these same kind of questions will become much more prevalent and will challenge us to think about what the right way to use them are. I, I thought this was uh, really interesting because it, these, there are prediction models for parole. And uh, increasingly, people are using algorithms. And uh, this is, uh, so things are consequential, but it's even becoming more consequential as papers are starting to come out and predict your prognosis. And what if they're biased? What if they aren't as accurate? What's the validation? How can you trust them? What was included in them? These things are going to have very uh, large consequences for us as we go on. Th there are other issues about this revolution, which it has to do with the workflow and the way in which they're implemented. Will they be seamless or will they be distracting? Uh, this is the famous painting. This is someone's uh, mo uh, sort of making lightheartedness of what this painter might put out today if they were to uh, take a look at the way in which the workflow goes for most doctors. A and again, this isn't a direct harm of the digital medicine and AI world, but it's it's a side effect of the way in which it's being implemented and the way in which it's disturbed the way that we, we have traditionally practiced medicine. My, my, my own sense of opportunity and uh, about this is when, when I see that Amazon learns, you know, every purchase on Amazon, every search on Google, every mile driven on Tesla makes these companies smarter. They're built to learn with each interaction. They generate collective knowledge. I, I, I often when I'm trying to make this point, say that, you know, Amazon doesn't say, we need to be a smarter company, so we need a big R&D division. What I'm gonna do is hire a bunch of academics from Yale. We're gonna cut a data set from the last three years at Amazon. Of course, we don't have data for the last 18 months because it takes 18 months for the data to come in. So we're gonna give them three years of data, but that starts, the, the most recent data will be 18 months ago. We're gonna give them a grant. We're gonna ask them to give us some specific aims, really dive into this data and give us some insights for our business. We'll give them a three to five year grant. Yeah, maybe we'll give them three, they'll last for two, no cost extensions at least. We'll get it up to five. Then they'll come out, they'll make a few presentations at meetings, but they won't really have their papers ready till the end. They'll submit their papers, it'll take them two years to publish those papers. Then what we're gonna do at Amazon is we're gonna have journal clubs. We're gonna have some journal clubs as soon as those papers are published. As soon as those papers are published, we're gonna get around most, a lot of our people around lunches and, and you know we'll bring food and we'll talk about the papers, and we'll talk about what they showed, and then what we're gonna do is take another year and we'll write some guidelines at Amazon. Because we're gonna take those papers and then we're gonna turn them into standard operating procedures and policies that will govern the way we do at Amazon. And that's gonna make Amazon great. That's gonna make sure we serve every customer. And then we're gonna do it again, because we're so happy with this, you know, it's true the data is a decade old by the time it gets out, and it's so effective to have journal clubs and guidelines and tell people what they should do that we're going to keep doing it again and again and again. We're going to spend tons of money on this, and we're going to be the best company ever. That, that's, I don't know if you've noticed, that's not what they do. That they, every time you click in Amazon, they get smarter. Their algorithms learn. They're more customized. They're more personalized. They, they're sharper. And, and that doesn't exist at all in medicine. We sequester knowledge, we sequester data, we silo it. The next person isn't benefited from all the people that came before. We don't create collective knowledge. We, we look for the person with gray hair and try to figure out the person who's had the most experience and hope that their own cognitive biases don't conspire against any sort of wisdom that they may wanna uh, provide. And then occasionally we'll write check textbooks or case studies, but it takes a long time. So what is this AI thing anyway, you know, to, to just to get into this? By the way, what it is mostly right now, it's a means by which companies can give valuation. 
And with all respect, uh, Walter, I think it was brilliant to name it .ai, like that must have doubled your valuation right away. So, you know, and I think as Greg showed, you look at the digital health side, literally if I say that and I add a word like blockchain in, I'll get another 25%. And then if I wave my hands and say digital medicine on top, you know, it, all of a sudden I can get a lot of investors. And I, I know it seems crazy, but that's really, I've seen it time and time again. And I'm not even really sure what it is they're doing. Now, um, the, the, the AI has got a taxonomy. There's a lot of different areas, machine learning, natural language processing, expert systems, computer vision, speech. There's a whole range of different areas. But it's not enough to say that there are these technical things. The truth is a lot of the big companies like Google have made it quite easy for even people with quite standard skills to be playing in a very sophisticated space. TensorFlow has, has transformed the way we've done it. Microsoft's done the same, Amazon. They, they, they've commoditized to a large extent. That's not to diminish the amazing work that's being done across campus where people are doing cutting edge new algorithms and solving hard problems, but we haven't even begun to crawl in medicine. I mean, we could make use of the kind of technology and knowledge that was available a decade ago and we'd be way ahead of where we are now. I thought it was interesting when I looked at Google Trends for AI, by the way, this goes back to 2004, as far back as I go. And, you know, actually, it's only in the last couple of years, this thing has really taken off in terms of being sort of a, a trend. It's not that AI was ever not there. If you look at citations or paper production going back to 1950, people have been talking about AI for a long time. But, but you're seeing a growing, uh, and this is, by the way, uh, this is uh, exponential. So you're seeing a growing uh, uh, amount of, of material that's being put out there. And you know, you may have noticed the Turing Awards this year uh, went to uh, Benji Lacuna and Hinton for their work in, uh, in neural nets. And uh, it really is the work they did in the late 90s and early 2000s that sort of led to what we're able to do today, which has really been transformative. So this is a quote from an article on this, but I, I thought it was instructive because it sort of tells you why now, what, what is really going on now? And it's really the cheap processing power from GPUs, which were originally designed for gaming. You know, they talk about CPUs were in your ordinary computers, but people talk about these GPUs because they were sort of built for video gaming. They were, they were sort of maximizing the ability to do high level computations for gaming. And an abundance of digital data, mostly given off by the internet, the same way a car gives off fumes, offered fuels for these little cognitive engines. And since 2012, the basic techniques that, that Benjo Hinton and LeCun pioneered, including backpropagation, CNNs, have become ubiquitous. And for technology as whole, but, but I'm telling you that these guys did such a good job and the, the people in this field are so generous that actually it has been commoditized to a large extent at the, at, at the I wouldn't say the bottom level, but at a very sophisticated level of being able to do this work. And so, you know, people talk about artificial intelligence broadly and machine learning, even logistic regression, a traditional technique we use when we use the computer to select the variables in the model is a form of machine learning. So we, machine learning is not also a, necessarily a new technique, but it's this deep learning that but has often comes with a black box. It, it's these techniques that produce output that can be very close to optimal solutions and optimize what it is you're looking at but without telling you exactly what it is. And so these are the, the, this is a timeline at the bottom and sort of says, you know, AI captured the, intel, the imagination of the world, machine learning starts to gain traction, but it's really in the last 10 years. And again, with the computation, with the cloud, with what the big companies have produced and with the large amounts of data increasingly available, we've started to enter a time of deep learning and, and you all are, t are taking advantage of it. I mean, anyone who has one of the new iPhones you know, is basically in your everyday life is making use of these algorithms. I mean, you're used to making use of them all the time in so many different ways that you're not available to, including all those potentially hazardous ways that are potentially affecting society. But, but just as a simple way, I mean, this is enabled because of the work that, that they did. And it, it's, it's, it's changed. This guy writes, uh, in 10 years, the iPhone replaced all this stuff that like used to be in a Radio Shack ad. But but a lot of the stuff that's being done on your phone today is a result of what is, uh, what, what is be behind it and under the hood in AI system. So, you know, who doesn't use one of these to try to figure out what route to take for a trip? I mean, it's not enough that we see a map anymore. 
And to be able to project, it's not just showing you the traffic, but it's projecting what the traffic's gonna be. Go on, on Google Maps and say, I wanna go to the airport. On what You can put what day at what time. And it's projecting for you what it's gonna be like based on what it knows. I mean, it's changing every facet of our lives, uh, but still remains uh, a little bit outside of medicine. So, so what's medicine like? You know, medicine's still like this. You know, you know this old saw from the weather, uh, red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. Have you ever, you ever heard that? So, you know, it's a heuristic. You know, it's a rule of thumb. It's like, okay, I know this, then that should probably happen. It, it actually showed up even back in the Bible, in the New Testament in Matthew. Uh, he, uh, he answered them, when it's evening, you say it's weather, for the sky is red in the morning today, for the sky is red and threatening. Uh, English Standard Version of the New Testament. So, I mean, this is, this is but by the way, this is sort of like what medicine is now. You know, I, if you see this, that means that. And uh, by the way, it's, it's not bad. I mean, what it means is the sun's coming up, and if, this, if the clouds are coming from the west toward the east, the sunlight reflects off moisture-laden uh, underside of the clouds and produces red. That works if the, if the clouds are going from west to east. Actually, if the clouds are going from east to west, the sky's clearing, and it's actually not telling you the same. And, and at certain latitudes in the country, depending on the prevailing winds, that'll either work well or, or it's not. And that's also a lot like medicine. Uh, you know, these heuristics sometimes work. Sometimes they don't, but, but it, it's a question of whether we need to get to more sophisticated approaches. So what, the National Weather Service didn't start accumulating a lot of these heuristics, but instead they did started collecting a lot of data. And I, I think what's going on in the Weather Service is a good uh, example to us. You know, there are millions of sensors and they collect data all over the world. And those, that data is streamed into supercomputers where they have the most advanced algorithms in which they're trying to make predictions so that I can tell not only what's going to happen today, but 10 days. I know people like to make fun of weather forecasters, but I find they're mostly accurate. They're, it's remarkable, and it, it is very different than what I remember growing up. I mean, they, they are pretty good. And, and not only that, they do a really good job of taking complicated information and showing it in ways that are easy to understand. These, this isn't maybe even the best example, but my mother lives in Florida, you know, and, and by the way, she never took the course. She never got the degree in weather maps. But, you know, she's watching the TV, she's seeing a weather map, and she's saying to me, you know, well, that hurricane that's coming, you know, the European model looks like it may go a little north of us, and the American model looks like it could come to us, and there's a lot of uncertainty, it could either come to us. She's talking about confidence intervals and different models, and, like, it's amazing. I mean, you know, you can actually take this very complex information and portray it in ways that are easy to understand. And this is today's map, and it's got high dimensional information. It's got, it tells you location, it tells you uh, type of precipitation, the intensity of the precipitation, and this is a very simple map. But underneath it, underneath it is very deep math and very deep data. And you know, this is what the promise in medicine I think is, you know, same with these autonomous vehicles. I think what's interesting about them is they're not being taught to drive individually, but they're being prepared to be able to communicate with each other in a collective. And not only that, unlike medicine, it's not like one car learns and then, by the way, buy the car that's really smart. Like, that's a good car to get. Like, which one of these is the smartest car? It's like every mile that was ever driven makes the next car smarter and better able to work, and it's working collaboratively with all the other cars eventually if we get into this kind of ecosystem. And again, different from medicine, where, like, I may be smart, I may have a lot of experience, I may have, have done that, I gotta find a smart doctor. Who are the best doctors? You know, it, it, it's insane really if you think about it, that, that it's like that. So the, the opportunity that exists within medicine is this digitization of the data. You know, the crash in 2008 led to a large investment in making most of the medical information in the country digital. So that means p medicine could play in this field. I mean, what was essential for all of these things was that there be data. And, you know, we have tons of data sources, both in the clinical uh, arena, but also in people's lives that, that are relevant to healthcare decisions and to speak to the empowerment choices that they have to make and understanding what the trade-offs are of different decisions. And so th this is the, we've just gone through just about a decade of getting to the point where so much health information, particularly in the clinical arena, is now digital. And the possibility of connecting people 
and learning and creating a collective wisdom, not a sequestered knowledge where you're finding the smartest doctor, but the means by which every person who comes through is generating insights that's leading to a collective stronger whole. That, that's the holy grail. That's what we need to be going for. But meanwhile, the experience is very different. You know, this is an article, Gawande writes, why doctors hate their computers. Doctors, instead of being so excited about this era, thinking that, wow, I'm it's like giving me a jetpack. Instead of walking places, I'm gonna get places faster, quicker. I'm gonna be going in the air. It's gonna be so much fun to do my job now. Doctors think this is just crushing them. And you know, Gwandi said, I've come to feel a system that promised to increase my mastery over my work has instead increased my work's mastery over me. The, the, you want to listen to negative response from doctors? Tell them you've got a technology solution for something. Tell them you're going to help them in their everyday work by adding decision support, for example, to the EHR. Like, look at the expression on their face when you start telling them how you're here to help. It, it, it's not well received, and, and for good reason. So far, the experience of most practitioners has been negative, and for most patients, it's been neutral. It's been, or negative, in the sense that it's pulling people's eyes away from them, the connection, the, the, all this empowerment has yet to be achieved. And, and meanwhile, like, what's happening in the nation? We digitized since 2008. We are gaining greater capability. We think that AI is gonna help so much. But like, you see, this is life expectancy at birth on the uh, y-axis, health expenditure at the bottom. Everyone else is spending a lot less and getting a lot more life expectancy. We're spending so much more, and it hasn't changed at all since, since the uh, institution of all this digital data. We're off the curve, and we remain off the curve. We're, we're getting more and more off the curve all the time. For other countries, the more you spend on health, the longer you get for life expectancy. Of course, that's not just health care. That's economic well-being. That's, that's a lot of things that go with that. But, you know, it starts to flatten out at a point. But the U.S. is way off the curve, and there's no sign that we're getting closer to the curve so far with what we've been able to implement. And, and if anything, our life expectancy, as you may have seen from the CDC, is actually dropping. Now, you can say suicide, opioids, despair. That's not AI's fault. Okay, Some, but society, culture, our health care, our ability to focus on well-being, all these things are connected to this. And we at least can say we're not making it a lot better since we've gone through this. So, so, so what, are the, what is it that makes you optimistic? And I will say, I wrote in my disclosure, my last one was, I'm an optimist. I actually think in the next decade, medicine will be fundamentally different. I believe healthcare will be fundamentally different, and our ability to promote health will be fundamentally different, and better, and remarkably better. And it will forge new models of the way in which this will work. But, but how is this going to go from a paper culture? And even though we are digital, we... Trust me, it is mostly a paper culture. And, and this retrofitting of a digital world into paper workflows, instead of rethinking the entire way the system is set up, what individual patients need, who needs to see them, at what level, what can be handled at home or by uh, you know, other means and making people wait in a waiting room and see one by one for a 10 minute talk in which eight minutes are spent trying to find the data that's necessary for the meeting. How many times have I sat with a patient where they had to dump all their pills on the desk and we spent most of the meeting just trying to figure out what's in the bottles? Like that, that's the current state even today. And then we still are rife with human error. Human error is everywhere in our system. There's an estimate between, this is an old estimate, 44 and 96,000 people die in U.S. hospitals as a result of human error. People call it the third leading cause of death. The, we've got an imperative to start thinking about how do we use data, these smart systems, to make it a safer, more effective, more equitable system. It sits there in front of us. But, but you know, the, the opportunities to grow are, is immense. This is the state of the art right now for helping a patient make a decision about whether they should thin their blood if they've got a heart rhythm problem called atrial fibrillation. If they've got an irregular heart rate, which can cause a stroke, we, we often will suggest that they take a blood thinner in order to reduce the risk, but that incurs a risk of bleeding. So it can be a tough decision. But what we do is we've created this risk score that's not more than your hands and fing fingers. And I say that because if we have Armageddon and there's no electricity, you can still do it because you just use your hands. And it's one point or two points, really easy. If you have hypertension, no matter what kind of hypertension, you get a point. Now, if you get a heart failure, if it's severe or it's light, you had it 20 years ago or you had it yesterday, we'll give you a point. If you're a woman, 
We give you a point, no matter what kind of woman you are. So, you know, it, it does, and then we have a heuristic. If you have two points, you should be anticoagulated. That's what a lot of, that's what our guidelines say. I mean, it does, this is, a, this is the, uh, how far we have to go in an era where you're using a sophisticated AI and massive computers to tell you how, what route to take home, and yet when you have a decision about whether you should take a blood thinner or not, instead of giving you a precise estimate for bleeding and for stroke, what the likely gain is, who, what you are trading off in the decision, you, none of that in the current era is available. So my point is to try to push this idea to learn from every interaction, build from collective wisdom. My, my friend Eric Topol wrote this book about trying to talk, mostly inspire people about the possibilities and the way the humanity can be put back into this. Somebody tell Eric I did this so that he'll be happy. But, you know, it's an idea where he's collecting stories and giving examples. And so it's starting to gain some traction. Um, this is, you know, Google's done a lot of work with uh, looking at the fundus. Uh, and they say here in their ad, I thought it was cute, the same technology that knows your dog from a cat helps doctors know a healthy eye from an at-risk one but yet still nobody's using it in practice in, at scale right now. So will this spread? How will it spread? For individuals, I don't even need to see a doctor. I may be able to just take a picture of my eye and get some sort of diagnosis. People are doing that for rashes now. I mean, the, the possibilities of people being able to have pattern recognition without needing to go find a doctor, or uh, and many doctors may not be experienced in this or skilled, or since medical school may not have had much practice. And for a rare rash or unusual findings in the retina, but, but an AI system could do it remarkably well. This is something that happened this week, just to give you a, a, a sense of the breadth of possibility. You may have heard this, brain signals trans, translated into speech using artificial intelligence. So they had a bunch of people with epilepsy who are already getting a patch placed on the brain uh, to collect information. And what they did was they had these people uh, read and then they used that as the training set. And then they had a bunch of people uh, uh, then uh, read to themselves and try to see if they, they knew what, what it would do to muscles and they tried to create speech out of it. So people are just thinking words. There are many people who are paralyzed and can't speak and so, or, or intubated or a wide range of things where they can't communicate. And this was the patch that was on the brain. But take a listen to this. So the first thing is gonna be the person reading. The second is what they're thinking and what the computer's able to produce. Shipbuilding is a most fascinating process. Shipbuilding is a most fascinating process. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. So the, the point is not perfect, but they're early. And that's a remarkable replication of what it is that someone's saying. And uh, I think sort of amazing. So, you know, what's gonna keep us from getting to where we need to go? I mean, we need to be able to get the data to produce the knowledge, to get the action. We've gotta be thinking clearly about, you know, what are the right problems to focus this on? By the way, using AI to tell me something I already know, something that's obvious, something that's, that I, you know, doesn't necessarily require it, if, is, if anything, wasteful, if not insulting. I mean, we, we need to be able to figure out where's the, where's the place to focus. And we also are gonna need to be thinking about like the meteorologist. How do we communicate information? So under the hood, it's really hardcore math. Well, under the hood, it's high level computation. But where it gets to the people who are using it, we've understand their task, we've understand their information needs, we understand how they can perceive. And so like my mother, you never have to take a class in weather. You don't have to become a meteorologist or, or like the iPhone. I mean, you know, my mother's 80, uh, being filmed, so I won't say. My mother's older than I am. And she is able to use uh, a lot of the technology seamlessly because of the way that the design was. Now, every day someone's pushing something. This just came out this week was approved by the FDA for chronically ill people. It uses machine learning to, by the way, cleared, not approved, it's cleared. So that means that they didn't make an assessment of whether or not it, it does something beneficial. They said, you know, it's, it fits with predicate devices that would say 
it can collect information and, and show it. But they say it uses machine learning to analyze data collects and notifies doctors of problematic changes on their mobile devices or in electronic health records. Now, I, I didn't spend hours, but I'd spent some time trying to figure out where's the data, where's the paper, what exactly have they done? And I can't find it. Now, it may be out there, but the question is where will this be cataloged? What independent group is going to be looking at the work that people do to give some sense of what it produces? I will say that in the end, my own sense of this is that it's going to be really important for us to get data. The major choke point for most of what we want to do in medicine still remains the absence of training sets, the absence of the data that we need. And even though we can declare victory on so much of the data being digitized, it still is not well integrated. We have interoperability issues. It's siloed. LeCun says he's optimistic about the prospects of artificial intelligence. But he's also clear that much more work needs to be done before the field lives up to its promise. Current AI system needs lots of data to understand the world, can be easily tricked, and we're only good at specific tasks. We just don't have machines with common sense. I, I want to just unpack this a second. He does say lots of data first, and I think it's a requirement. How are we going to break down the barriers so that we can actually get the data we need to do the work? He does say, by the way, easily tricked. That gets to the bias issue that I mentioned. And then uh, we're only good at specific tasks. I do want to say that there are a lot of tasks that people say AI for because it sounds cool, but actually doesn't perform any better than more traditional ways of doing things. So we always ought to be defaulting to simpler is better, and, and I think this is wise. But, you know, this is the famous Sherlock Holmes quote, data, 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 I can't make bricks without clay. You can have the most sophisticated approaches, but if we don't have the, the reagents that we need, it's not going to work. We at Yale have been working very hard to try to not be under the thumb of the electronic healthcare vendor, but to be able to create our own integrated data repository that can stream and integrate data from all parts of the healthcare system, whether they're coming from machines or from directly from patients or whether they're in the, in the clinical record, so that we can control our destiny about the data, that we get it into a place where we can harmonize it and organize it and create common data models so we can collaborate with others. And we believe that this is going to be the way of the future. All of the places that have whole data need to not be uh, trapped by proprietary models, but be in a position where they're using open source tools so they can avidly set the rules for those who want to work with them. And they can also make it so that every new decision support or every new tool that someone wants to say doesn't require a different way in, that there's a standard way in which everyone interacts with the system and we can learn. So we're building platforms, real-time clinical analytics, trying to see if we can achieve this idea of data coming in and learning and, and being able to um, then send it back at the point of care and doing it so fast that it's occurring in a time frame that can be helpful. This change in consumer data revolution is also an important piece that Greg said, and I personally am highly committed to this and have developed uh, and founded a company that is intended to try to help people be empowered with their data. The notion being no data should be sold behind your back. You should be able to get agency over your data. That data should be able to be integrated and acquired seamlessly and should be prepared for your use, clinical use for you to participate in research for a wide variety of purposes. And so this is just one, I'm not I'm just saying that uh, this is what we've done that enables people to collect a broad range of health data. People can get it from their records, from their wearables, from CVS, from, from Medicare, from, from wherever it sits and fill out surveys. And they can build their own health data assets so then they can participate in a health data uh, uh, environment, an ecosystem. And, and also be able to make sure that their experience feeds into the knowledge of helping the next person who's going to follow them. And, you know, we're deeply committed to this idea of paying it forward. And when you talk to most patients, they say, I want the next person to be in a better position than I was. I want the knowledge to not have been lost as a result. We also have been realized that the challenge is not only acquiring and normalizing the data, but ensuring high-quality data harmonization, bringing together data from different sources, and ensuring we know the meaning of each element. Data quality is not a commodity. It's a point of differentiation. What I learned was that all of these vendors, they created dialects. They may have had the same products, but... The Hartford Hospital's epic is very different from Yale's epic. And you've got to then be able to create the engines that create the semantic interoperability and the means by which we can line up and map the information in meaningful ways. That, that shouldn't have been necessary, but it turns out to be an important other obstacle. For one of our patients, you know, it, it's going to enable us to collect dense data about things that we just didn't have any idea about. 
This is a patient who uh, the, the right at the zero of the x-axis is pre-op. And then they had mitral valve repair. And we started, we collected a whole range of questions on them and about their activity and their sleep. This is at just activities of daily living to start to chart their recovery after surgery. Before this, you would ask the surgeon, well, how long is it gonna be before I feel better? I don't know, they'd say, I don't know, maybe a month, maybe two months, I don't know. You know, we, we, don't, we weren't charting this experience. We weren't being able to say, well, who recovers the best? Who the worst? By the way, when we're looking at you and you come into the office, are you at the 50th percentile? Are you at the top, at the bottom? Can we preempt problems because we tell you're not making it? Like we would do with growth curves in children. Hey, you're falling off the recovery curve. Maybe there's something we need to do to intervene. The, the promise of digital medicine now is that this stuff can move quickly, seamlessly, it's timely. The marginal cost is low. We can get people on board and, and most people already have mobile devices. So it's not like I have to stock everyone with their own personal computers. They've actually, most people have it and it's growing over time. So it's a remarkable opportunity. So just to finish up, I say, you know, 1903, the, the Wright brothers are Kitty Hawk. I mean, they're happy they're going a football field or two, you know, and celebrating that they can just even get this thing to, to seemingly make any movement at all. And you know, like a decade later, for unfortunate purposes, but by decade later, we've got planes flying all over the place in World War I. You know, the, the, the investment, the commitment, yeah, was about uh, a war, but, but it, it meant that that, just think about that, 1903, you know, that's the first time they're getting, uh, getting off the ground. And then a decade later, this becomes almost routine. And then, you know, to the point we are today. So the opportunity, I think, is of this digital medicine is to leverage the digital transformation, to learn from every interaction, to create tools for people. And I'd say that first, for people. And then for health professionals, health systems, and policymakers that elevate performance, improve outcomes, drive value, and ultimately promote health and well-being in ways that we've been able to do before. Inform choices in ways we haven't been able to do before. Help people learn from each other and, and figure out what they want to do. In the end, I just want to say why we talk about all this technology, it has to serve the people in need, the people who depend on this information to be right, the people who are looking up in moments where they're most vulnerable and weakest and hoping that the systems are there to protect them, promote, promote their interest, and, and make sure the best things happen. So um, with that, I want to say thank you. Maybe just a few minutes for questions. Or? Yeah. So, data. The, the, what are the three most important things? Data, data, data. Yeah. So, um, let, let's, uh, if, if there's a, 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 in the spirit of the symposium, very thought provoking, um, uh, let, let's leave time for a question or two if anybody uh, has a comment or a question. We have mics down front if you can. Uh, good morning. Thank you for an excellent presentation. My question is not about data, but the algorithms that go with it, and primarily regulating those algorithms. Mycin, the example you showed, uh, I studied, remember studying that back in the 80s as an undergrad. It explained itself, and it did it quite fairly well. Mycin had almost, in certain cases, almost 60% accuracy. But it explained itself. But today, we have algorithms that are proprietary, intellectual property, so how would we regulate it? Should we have clinical trials for algorithms, or should it, be, uh, should it explain itself? Should it be open source? So I think it, it's a really good question. How do we evaluate these? And I think we have to realize that there's several aspects to any of this. They are complex interventions. So there's a question of whether they do what you expect. It's sort of like, does this pill do what I expect it to do? And then when I use this pill under ideal conditions, does it produce what I hope it will for human health. And then when it's in the real world outside of that idealized environment, does it produce what I hope it can do? And it can fail at each step. It can fail in its mechanism. It can fail in it under ideal conditions. It can fail because everything was perfect, but when it's being used by people in the real world, it's used uh, in ways that, that countervene it. I mean, even like 737 Max, you could have said, well, if you had a pilot who really knew how to manage that plane in that moment, they would have averted the crash. But an average pilot's not ready within 30 seconds to be able to spring to action on that, even if one time they heard an instructional video about it. So I think that we, there, we need to be thinking about those three levels. 
like we do for pills, but I also then think we need to think about what's at stake. So high stake decisions, high stake issues should, should play, I think we, we need to be able to invest more in understanding what, what it's doing and the interpretability of it is more important. We can't just have a black box and assume it's working because one day someone validated it. If it's continuing to evolve, we need interpretability, we need continued testing. If this thing is telling who can go on parole, if it's saying who can die, and people are making decisions on life-extending therapy as a result, we need to be able, if it's flying planes, we need to be, it needs to have a certain level. If it's something like, do I wanna buy these socks or those socks, probably it's a very different you know, level of scrutiny that it needs to undergo because if it's failing, then people just stop buying socks and you can say we, we're, this thing's not offering people what they want. So I, I, I don't have the pat answer for this, but this is where we are in the field, right? We've got to move quickly because people are promoting solutions where the data is not transparent and we're not clear what the validation has been. And, and for high stakes decisions, it needs to be absolutely transparent. And, I, and people talk a lot about this uh, a lot, XAI, the explainable part, the interpretable part. How do we understand what it is that's actually producing it? We may not really know within the, in the neural net, but we need to know at least what information is it leveraging the most in order to make the, make the output and how are we continually evaluating whether it's that. And I just say one quick thing, and the bias is gonna be really important. Just because we can replicate what's doing, if we're getting that result because we're treating some people in ways that aren't equitable, that we're not, we're not treating them well, we don't wanna just incorporate that into an algorithm. We wanna actually identify it and get rid of it. So, you know, these are all important aspects, I think, of how this gets played out.